thank you for having me. And, and uh, I think it's a very important topic. It's interesting. I, I teach at George Mason uh, just down the road, and I just came from transportation class, and we, we just had this debate class regarding uh, TNCs and Uber and Lyft and others as well, and the taxi industry. And so my, my job tonight is get you as fired up as my students were about all of this. If, if, if not, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. So my role is to provide some context, I think, and um, it's a very uh, broad topic from a policy perspective, as well as for the consumer. And so what I want to do is discuss a little bit of the background that I can bring to bear with regard to this topic, uh, and look a little bit at the history. Uh, the idea of ride sharing is actually not very new in this country, and we can talk then about perhaps the political dynamic regarding this issue. Talk a little bit about the economics. This is obviously very relevant to demand, not only in Arlington, but across the country. And then we'll look at some trends that are gonna bear on this particular, uh, in this area, as well as across the country. And then finally, some questions, some that are related to my research as a transportation policy analyst. And if, feel free to interject at any point, there's no. So this is a graphic from the War Department, actually from the Second World War. And, uh, was highly topical at the time, but from a resource base. We're, we're not in that mode today. We're, we're not talking about rubber, and uh, we're, we're all driving now on synthetic rubber anyway, so that's not an issue. But uh, this was obviously a different time, but the concept of ride sharing you know, is at least that old. Um, we have a, a context in this region with regard to slugging, where we have in, informal ride sharing. And, Interestingly, when you look at this topic from a federal highway perspective, they've, they've gone to different areas of the country where this is actually occurring and found that it may be operating if, if save for if the interference or the regulation of the government. And so one of the comments and much some of the literature that I've looked at from federal highway on slugging makes the, the comment that this is operated without for years now, well, you know, decades, without really any kind of formal regulation from government. Uh, and obviously, when it couldn't occur everywhere across the country. You only see it in a, a few cities where it's very popular. But DC is an example of this kind of, you know, a, a government, no regulation, and this is operating successfully for many years. With regard to the politics, and it's, it's very timely we have this conversation tonight, uh, our institute uh, came out with a report on Monday discussing the political dynamic in jurisdictions across the country where is this, there is this tension between TNCs, these uh, Uber and Lyft, and uh, taxis. And they found that really there may not be as much of a political dy dynamic as we might think. Uh, the New York Times has been writing about the, the regulatory versus free market uh, bents of either political party. The other issues have to do with the fact that this is a part of the sharing economy. This is a, a typical part of uh, you know, with regard to the apps that are used for uh, these particular services, these are very common now for a lot of different kind of consumer demand that's out there. So it, it doesn't seem as if there's a, a very strong political dynamic to that. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I know we're in Washington, D.C., and there has to be a political dynamic, but it may not be as prominent as we might think. And then uh, with regard to the economics, um, again, this is very recent uh, kind of polling that was done on a, a group of economists uh, from what is known as the IGM forum. And they asked this very basic question, whether or not there was some welfare for the public with regard to some kind of equilibration between uh, taxis and Uber and Lyft and other kinds of TNC firms. And they found that most agree that there is some benefit. Now, the stipulation is that one of the economists polled is actually an economist for Uber, so there may be a little bias in, in, their, in their ideas, but uh, some of the comments are very telling in that, you know, how this is perceived by economists uh, is, in, in, you know, when I talk informally with students and others, is, is very common kind of ideas about uh, competition and the market. And I think that's one of the questions that I, I'm in kind of thinking about this topic and, and how to formulate policy or think about a research project related to it. I think the, the biggest question I have is related to what exactly is the market for, for these kinds of services? So the trends that are relevant to the, this particular issue have to do with the sharing economy in general and the ability of someone to use an app to either share space in a vehicle, share their own space and living space, et cetera, 
Uh, and this is not just in DC, it's across the country. These apps for this particular service are ubiquitous. So uh, I needed a cab to go pick up my car and the taxi company where I live in Maryland uh, offered me a discount if I used an app to, to book the ride. So it's not as if uh, Uber is the only uh, provider that's allowing the customers to access the service through an app. Uh, taxis now are becoming more reliant on navigation. I've seen this in my own experience. There was a New York Times article as well regarding uh, London taxi cabs who needed to know a lot in, uh, like upstairs between their two ears about how to get from point A to point B. And because they're more now reliant on navigation systems, the threshold by which they have to achieve their you know, licensure and their certification has gone down. Uh, so where it's, you know, they've actually done, uh, neuroscientists have done studies on the ability of the brains to learn the different routes in and around London, and they've used taxi drivers from London to look at our ability to learn the origin destination routing uh, and how sophisticated the brain is in, in like remembering those kinds of journeys. The other issues have to do with the fact that the population is aging in place. Population is aging, we're driving our vehicles longer, and so there are a lot of trends that have to do with how accessible will locations be if we need a whole range of options. Right? If you can't just rely on either public transportation or private means to make those kinds of trips. The other issues have to do with demand for what are known as dedicated services. So I and only I are, am the one who's using this particular vehicle. I and only I are using this kind of service. And this is a general trend you see quite often. I've seen this in my research with regard to public transit. Uh, I'm from the University of Connecticut and they it developed an it, a regional system for buses, but the students didn't want to ride on the buses because they weren't Yukon buses. They wanted a dedicated bus with their logo on it, and they didn't want to ride with the general public. And this is a part of this sort of, not necessarily the demand, but it's the dedicated nature of the services that people expect today. And then finally, one of the things that I, I, I talk quite a bit with my students about is how transportation amongst any, all these different sectors of the economy are really where we see sort of the emergence of these technologies because we often see technology as a sign of how modern our society is. We want the bullet train and it's got to be the fastest bullet train. We want the planes and they got to go fast and they got to be shiny. And it, transportation, it seems to me, is a natural kind of uh, balancing point, tipping point for a lot of these technological applications because this is what we see as a sign of our own advancement. Uh, uh, I lived in Asia for quite a long time, and there they're trying to build buildings that are just a little taller than their neighboring countries, right? So if they have a little taller building, the next country wants a little taller building. Well, we have the same kind of status with regard to our transportation. And so it, this debate is very uh, topical with regard to how we see transportation. The other issues that I think are relevant to talk about um, from my perspective as an analyst and someone who's interested in scholarly publication has to do with the market. So. Uh, I don't know from a, just from a policy background how you regulate something where you have no idea what the market actually is, what the demand is. Very difficult. And so I'm very interested in how we look at the, the dynamics of, of the market today and over, say, the last five years. The issues regarding insurability and liability are paramount. And then finally, issues regarding how we regulate. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Colin Tews, who is the director of East Coast Public Policy uh, for Uber Technologies. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks especially to uh, our generous hosts, uh, and thank you for the dinner. And uh, thank you also um, particularly to Delegate Patrick Hope, who I know can't be here tonight, but uh, was kind enough to extend an invitation to me to, uh, to join all of you, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, again, my name is Colin Tews. I'm Director of Public Policy for Uber Technologies uh, here on the East Coast. And in my brief remarks tonight, I'd like to introduce you to Uber, explain what Uber is and some of the services we offer, and to talk briefly about Uber's presence in Virginia. And then at the end, I'd like to sketch out some thoughts on public policy as it relates to Uber and to our competitor companies and to ride-sharing ride services uh, generally. So first, what is Uber? Uber is a technology company headquartered in San Francisco, and it began in 2010. And in just four short years, Uber has expanded to 46 countries and more than 200 cities worldwide. And in the United States, 
We're in 120 uh, plus cities. I put plus because uh, we launched a few more cities this week and I, I haven't gotten the new number. I think it's about 125 as of tonight. Uh, in Virginia, uh, we're part of the Washington, D.C. coverage area, which you see here on the map. And I know that the print is very fine, but at the very top of that kind of blue bubble is uh, Gaithersburg, and then it extends as far south um, to uh, Dale City and Woodbridge, uh, and then west uh, out towards um, Aldi and, uh, and, and Bowie, Maryland in the east. Um, so that's roughly the D.C. market, so Arlington squarely in the middle of that. Elsewhere in Virginia, we operate in, um, well, uh, in Richmond, Hampton Roads, uh, Roanoke, Blacksburg, and Charlottesville. And here in Arlington, we operate four core products. Uh, the first is Uber Black, which is the uh, original service and probably the one for which we're best known. It connects riders to uh, professional livery drivers who are either affiliated with a limo, limo company uh, and then they partner with us in their off hours or in between trips, or uh, they're independent owner operators of, uh, of vehicles. And the vehicle you see here, this Audi, I think it's an A4 or A6, is representative of the type of vehicles. They're basically executive sedans. So it could be a Lincoln Town Car or a Chrysler 300. And then UberX is our ride-sharing product. It connects riders to who, people who are usually part-time drivers who are using their own cars, their own personal vehicles on the Uber platform. And to qualify, these cars have to be a 2004 model year or newer. Uh, they have to seat four passengers, and they have to be in exceptional condition. And it's what we call everyday cars for everyday use. So a typical UberX car might be a Toyota Prius, uh, like, like, uh, like you see pictured here, uh, or a Honda Accord or a Nissan Altima. And in terms of price, UberX, uh, depending on distance, but usually sits uh, somewhere between a taxi and a bus in terms of pricing. And then we have SUV variants on each of these products, so Uber XL on the value side, and then Uber SUV is a, a black, black car SUV product. As far as how it works, it's powered by a smartphone app, of course, either for iPhone or for Android. And uh, basically, to talk you through it, after you've downloaded the app and you've set up an account, you uh, then just open the app, you select the product that you'd like to use of the ones I just uh, mentioned, and then it detects your position by GPS, or you can manually enter a pickup address if you prefer, and you click the ride request button, which is that sort of black horizontal bar on the uh, phone image to the left. After that's done, um, that sends a signal to available drivers nearby that someone has requested a ride, and then they have the option to accept the ride if they wish, and they make their way to you. And as that happens, you'll see right there on your phone the name of the driver in the lower left corner on the middle there. You'll see their license plate number, the type of vehicle they're driving, uh, and their exact location. And it then updates in real time. And it's hard to see, but in the, in the center, you see a little black uh, rectangle in the middle phone. That's the image of a car. And you would, as it moved its way through the map towards you, you would be able to, uh, to track that. And for, Forgive me for anyone who's used our service, and this is review. Um, we'll get to some policy issues in just a minute. But uh, you get a notification on your phone that the, the driver is arriving. Uh, you get into the car, you tell the driver where you'd like to go, and you're off. And then when you arrive at your destination, you simply exit the vehicle. Uh, we've collected your payment information up front when you set up your account, so there's no cash to change hands, uh, and there's no need to tip. Seconds later, you're then emailed an itemized receipt to your phone that shows the exact route that you've just taken, the trip duration, the time of day, and then, uh, the, again, the driver's name is there for reference. And you see on the right side there, you're asked to rate the driver on a scale of one to five stars, and then you can provide feedback on any aspect of the trip that you wish, the route, if you're not happy with the route, or if the vehicle wasn't um, in the condition that is to your satisfaction, or if the driver uh, was annoying, or there's anything you simply didn't like about the trip. Um, you can uh, provide feedback to Uber, who will then contact the driver and provide that feedback. Um, or, um, uh, and, excuse me, then the driver is given the opportunity to rate the rider uh, as well. So, <laughs> so be on your best behavior, please. And this is all made possible by people choosing to seek and to provide rides using a software platform. Um, Uber, just to clarify, does not employ any drivers. Uber doesn't maintain a fleet and Uber doesn't own any cars. So that's the core product. 
um, in brief. And 2014 has been a big year for Uber, so I'd like to touch on a couple of exciting programs that we're especially proud of here in the DC area specifically. Earlier this year, we debuted a new product called Uber Family that includes a driver training program that offers some of the top rated drivers on the Uber platform the opportunity to become trained and certified to install and maintain car seats. And it's a partnership with a woman named Debbie Bear, who's the lady on the right here. She's affectionately known as the car seat lady, uh, because since the 1980s, when this was a brand new concept uh, for people, um, Ms. Bear was on the cutting edge of raising public awareness about uh, child passenger safety. And uh, she's dedicated her career to that. Uh, the young lady on the left is her daughter, Alyssa, who's a, a, an MD and has joined um, her mother in, uh, in this public awareness campaign. And so uh, the Car Seat Lady uh, is, is now a nonprofit organization and they have a training program. And we're very proud to partner with them to give parents in the DC area uh, affordable options to get around town safely with their children. Yesterday, of course, was Veterans Day. And so it's doubly fitting this week to mention another new program of ours called Uber Military. This is a special recruiting push we're making to help provide economic opportunities for our nation's veterans. The sad reality is that nationwide, 21% of veterans under the age of 25 are unemployed, along with 25% of military spouses. And in the next five years, it's expected that over 300,000 service members will be uh, transitioning to the civilian workforce. So Uber already partners with thousands of members of the military community. And based on a case study in San Diego, we found that veterans um, are really some of our best rated drivers. They're doing more trips on average per week than non-veteran drivers, and they maintain a higher driver rating and more frequent positive feedback from riders. Um, so our riders love veterans. We love veterans, not only because of the service they provide to our country, but also because they are just terrific partners for Uber. Uber Military has a goal of onboarding 50,000 veterans and military spouses during the next 18 months. And just last week, we announced the creation of our Uber Military Advisory Board. And we're especially excited to have the help and support of senior officers from every branch of the United States military. Robert Gates, who served both President Bush and President Obama as Secretary of Defense, is the chairman of the Uber Military Advisory Board. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal is a member, and there are several other notable um, uh, current and, and retired uh, senior officers, including a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who are lending their support to this initiative. And so it goes without saying that in the shadow of the Pentagon here in Arlington and in places like Hampton Roads, uh, Virginia is a key focus and a key beneficiary, beneficiary of the Uber military program. So in terms of the benefits for Uber, uh, to riders, the benefits are clear. Uber works efficiently and reliably, and it includes key accountability safeguards that are not present in other transportation options. It's all about providing a range of choices, high-end sedans for a night on the town or to accompany a client to a business meeting, uh, an SUV with car seats for a trip to the airport with the family, or UberX when your own car is in the shop or when Metro isn't running or just to run a quick errand. There are also clear benefits on the safety side, and another of our key partnerships is with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And while we haven't been able to analyze the data for all of our cities, just in Seattle, we've seen the DUI rates have plummeted by up to 10%, by, excuse me, by, by 10% uh, since Uber's entrance into that market. Um, it was mentioned earlier that Uber and, and like companies are controversial, and that's true, but I want to explain why and sort of really quickly in my brief remaining time set that in context. Much of the press that you see around Uber stems from the reality that existing ground transportation regulations were written decades before this technology existed and just don't account for it yet. So in Virginia, we're currently operating under a temporary operating agreement with Governor McAuliffe's office, and the agreement anticipates that the legislature will take up this issue during the 2015 session. As far as what that legislation could look like, uh, there's a great model right across the Potomac in the District of Columbia. The DC Council just passed a ride-sharing bill two weeks ago, sponsored by Mary Che and David Grosso. It's several years in the making, and we see it as a national model for, uh, for how to approach these questions. Um, the bill requires mandatory back background checks going back seven years, 
million dollars in primary insurance coverage and annual safety inspections. We see this as a great starting point for how to devise uh, sensible ride sharing regulations in Virginia that will provide for innovation and consumer choice, but also assure rider and driver safety. So my time is up, and I'd love to talk to anyone after the forum tonight if there are questions. And I gather there's a Q&A period in just a few minutes here, too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tears. And now with a Another perspective on the situation, we have Charlie King, who is the Vice President of Red Top Cab of Arlington. Mr. King. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening and to discuss this uh, interesting subject. I, I understand from the standpoint of the traditional uh, taxi cab industry, um, I guess we're traditional, uh, certainly in one sense. This is Red Top's 50th anniversary. Uh, serving the citizens and visitors to Arlington County. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, and I don't know whether we're traditional. I don't know if we're typical or not. We like to think we're maybe an example of what's possible. Uh, I don't know if we're necessarily the norm. Uh, our company has a long history uh, of uh, technological and other forms of innovation uh, that we use to try to enhance and improve our services over the years. Uh, and that's a lot of that's due to the forward thinking uh, uh, of our founder and president Neil Nichols, uh, who early on realized that uh, technology could be employed uh, in numerous ways to enhance our riders' experience and improve our service. And, and that's been certainly one of the keys to our success over the years. Uh, I, I don't. I think hopefully some of you ride a cab on occasion. I don't want to bore you too much with the details of how taxi cabs work because. We've been around a little bit longer and perhaps require less explanation. But in our case, uh, we, we have employed a lot of technology. Uh, we've used call center technology for some 30 years to manage traffic and make, and make the phone experience for those folks who still want to talk to a live operator uh, a, a little more enjoyable and efficient. Uh, we were one of the first large fleets in the country to introduce computerized dispatching now going back 25 years. And I promise you, they really were computers. Uh, and still are, uh, and uh, but we've migrated from that. Uh, have, have apps changed the way you hail a ride? Sure, they have. Uh, as Ed was kind enough to point out, uh, that just didn't just happen in the last couple of years, though, uh, through the advent of a couple of companies from the West Coast. Many of us have been off, have been providing service through online reservations or app reservations for several years. In our case, we introduced uh, the taxi apps uh, five years ago through a company called Taxi Magic, which is, is probably the most widely accepted taxi cab specific uh, smartphone app uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, and we were one of their early adopters. But in that service, uh, it has some similarities to what you just heard from Colin uh, in, in terms of, except that you can order a cab right away or you can schedule it ahead of time. You can pay by cash or you can pay by charge. Uh, and so on. So there's some, some flexibilities that are more tailored to our traditional marketplace. Uh, a couple of years ago, we realized that we needed to both control our brand and also try to tailor our offerings to our customers. We introduced our own app, our first version, uh, for my tax, for my cab rather, uh, which has been pretty successful amongst our ridership. We were already on our second generation app, uh, which among other things incorporates the uh, vehicle locator, similar to what you saw a few minutes ago, uh, GPS pickup address locator to make your ordering a little more convenient, uh, and uh, also the ability to have a card on file if you prefer transactionless uh, transportation. We're, we're, we're all trying to keep up with the competition because competition is what makes us all better. Uh, and we, you know, we, we firmly believe in that. Uh, our next generation app will be out shortly and will, in, will include all that plus some additional service offerings because we were also one of the earlier uh, operating sedan, operated sedan services in the Washington metropolitan area and we're folding that into it uh, also as, uh, to give our customers, uh, I guess, the maximum choices. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's, that's the path that we've been on for some time. Uh, and uh, and we think successfully so, and le and unless we think that all innovation is technology, I, we're also probably one of the innovations we're proudest of 
is our wheelchair accessible taxi cab service, which we introduced in Arlington in 1996 and has expanded over the years, has now expanded to our sister companies in Fairfax, uh, and has been recognized through Easter Seals, Independence Center, and a number of other organizations uh, for our commitment in, in that important area. Our, our core philosophy is that meeting our customers' needs requires that we give our customers choices. So you'll notice that everything that we've done, we try to in, actually expand the number of choices uh, that our customers have. Uh, in order to use our service, whether it's how they obtain the service, how they pay for the service, whether the service is accessible through accessible apps for people who may be visually impaired or accessible vehicles for people who may re rely on wheelchairs. Uh, and we've managed to achieve all this in a regulated taxicab environment, tra a traditionally regulated environment through the longstanding regulatory regime in Arlington County. And I guess this is a point where I don't want to disappoint you. First, I've disappointed you without a PowerPoint. And I don't want to disappoint you without fire and brimstone. But we don't think this is a fire. You know, this is a, a, a topic where fire and brimstone is appropriate. Although around the country, I'm sure Colin could tell, could tell you that's not always the case. But there are some fallacies, and with all due respect, in the TNC story. Uh, we can start with the idea of ride sharing. Ed and Colin and I can probably agree to disagree on how when you order service, it shows up, it picks you up, it takes you somewhere and it charges you for it. That's exactly ride sharing. Um, but again, you know, we can agree to disagree on that or as well as the notion that they're a technology company and not a transportation company for the same kind of reasons. But uh, I, I don't want to belabor that. I, I think maybe more important uh, and a little more, for lack of a better word, insidious is this notion that that because of technological innovation that the old the forms of regulation are obsolete. Uh, obviously, we've proved that you can function in a regulated environment and provide the public the services that they need. Uh, and, and we firmly believe that, uh, that that can be done. And you can flourish under a regulatory system. Uh, we don't think that, in a, so we don't think that innovation has negated the old rules, if you will. Uh, and we don't think that it stifles innovation, which is another claim that you often hear. Uh, and, and, and I think I like to think that we're proof of that. Uh, but again, you know, we, we know that Uber, Lyft, and others are, are here to stay, and it's what consumers like it. It's a slick piece of technology. And, you know, our hats are off to them as an industry, uh, and we realize that it, in our case, in our industry's case, we have to raise our game. Uh, some of us, some some of our sister companies have to raise their game higher than others. Um, but you know, we, we we think that that's where the discussion needs to go um, at, the, at at this point. Taxi cabs are probably much more regulated than any than a lot of you know. I know Angie De La Barrera is here from the county tonight. She probably knows since so she's the county taxi cab regulator. But everything from the number of companies, the number of cabs, the rates that we charge, uh, the types of vehicles that we operate, and so on are are all insured. They're all uh, are all insured. Pardon me. They're all regulated. Uh, it's done from a standpoint both of ensuring the public of a reasonable level of service, uh, also ensuring public safety, uh, and for a, serv and a service that's particularly, uh, particularly essential uh, for many of our riders, especially in a transit-friendly uh, community like Arlington County. Uh, and so, when you order a taxi cab, you you, know, you pretty much you know what you get. You know, you have a pretty good idea of the quality of the vehicle. Hopefully, the quality of the driver who's been vetted by the locality, uh, not through an online search by a third party uh, background check service. Uh, the prices are regulated. Uh, they don't surge during peak, you know, during peak period times, nor do we cut our prices to try to put our smaller competitors out of business. Uh, these are, you know, there's you know, various philosophies you know, that come into play here, but. That's the, that's the basis of, of taxi cab regulation. And it sounds like a lot. Some of you may think it's too much. Um, you know, I think, or that uh, you know, the taxi cabs need to be less regulated so they can be more competitive. And we, frankly, we, you know, we reject that notion. Um, we think that our, the, taxi cab, the taxi cab industry has been successful and has provided the service that people need in communities where it is well regulated. That said, do we have any expectation that these new companies are going to be regulated to the same extent or in the same ways that we are? 
No, we don't. No, I think that that's unrealistic. I think there are people who haven't given up that fight, and I like a fight as much as the next guy. But you know, this is a business. Uh, these are this is customer service. This is giving the public what it wants. Uh, as long as the public is adequately protected, um, you know, we we think that that is that that is our approach. We try to take a constructive approach to this. Uh, all due respect to our friends across the river. Uh, th thank you. Uh, the the new DC. The taxi cab statute does have some significant flaws in it, and hopefully the folks in Virginia will do better, but, and they'll do better in a way that will not prevent the, these new companies uh, from operating freely throughout the state and the markets where, where their service is, uh, is suitable. Uh, but the vehicles need to be properly insured. They need to be properly insured at all times, uh, not just when there's someone in the back seat. Uh, or to a lesser degree when the app is on and the drive's cruising around looking for a trip but he hasn't gotten one yet. Or if he decides now that he's become a driver for hire without a license, he's going to work off app, as the saying goes, uh, relying on his personal insurance, uh, which is not going to respond. Uh, and to the extent that it would have to respond, it would simply be offloading the cost of providing that critical protection onto the rest of us who drive personal cars. Uh, those are the kind of things that we think need to be addressed appropriately along with driver background and vehicle checks, that sort of thing. But again, this can be done, and this can be done in a way that we can all compete and prosper. And that's our, that's our perspective, at least, if not maybe our entire industry's perspective. Thank you. We have uh, a couple simple rules. The first one is please state your name so that we can all hear it. And the second one is please phrase your question in the form of a question. Charlie. Mr. Tews, I was wondering when Uber was rolling out, did they calculate that all the regulations that exist for the traditional taxi industry were just completely bogus and useless and we can just ignore them? Or, or do they have a plan for gradually understanding the, uh, what regulations might be needed? Sure. Uh, good, good question. Um, I've not been with the company since its beginning, but I feel confident in saying the answer is uh, is no, it wasn't devised with that mentality from the outset. And part of why I say that is that for, um, for a while, the Uber Black product that I spoke about, the um, delivery uh, product using, um, using um, uh, livery drivers uh, partnering usually with, as employees of um, of existing limousine companies, that was the not only the core product offering; that was the only core, uh, the only product offering. And so, uh, I don't know that taxi regulation was um, what was necessarily top of mind at the time. Um, the story of Uber's founding is kind of interesting. It started with um, with a New Year's Eve trip. Um, ex no, sorry, it was. I'm thinking of a different story. <laughs> uh, it started with a, uh, a trip that our uh, founder took to a uh, technology conference in uh, Paris with some of his uh, programmer friends from San Francisco. And uh, because this conference was underway, it was very difficult to find a, a taxi cab uh, when they were looking for one uh, late one evening. And it started as kind of a crazy idea. Hey, what if we had our own uh, limousines and could um, simply have it available um, when we wanted it? And then it shifted to what if we partnered with existing limousine companies um, and used what we're good at, to, uh, technology and programming, to find out a way to um, get them to us when we need them. Uh, and they tried it in San Francisco. I think they had four driver partners at the time. and. Um, and, and you see what it's grown to since then. So uh, I, I think it was kind of carried along uh, as it went. It, it didn't start necessarily with a, a, a mapped out plan to get to where we are today. Sure. Yeah, no, uh, that's not too surprising. I mean, it, it's... Um, there are, um, I, I think it's, it's common uh, across all kinds of industries for there to be... Um, incumbent market participants that, um, without necessarily intending to, uh, have uh, benefited from or acclimated to uh, a heavily regulated environment. And when a new market participant comes in, um, 
irrespective of uh, whether regulations are designed to um, apply to that market participant uh, at the outset, I think um, there's bound to be some resistance to um, to the new market players. And that's certainly been the case uh, in, in the industry that um, that Uber uh, plays in. Yeah, that's, that's undeniable. Um, yeah, I want to stress, though, that we're not um, looking for a completely uh, non-regulated environment. I, and uh, I was running out of time at the end, but um, you know, my job uh, in the public policy shop at Uber uh, is specifically uh, one of seeking to be regulated. And does, uh, part of that is designing regulations that reflect the realities of the industry uh, and uh, take them into account uh, for the long haul. Very basic question to the gentleman from Uber. How do you make money since you don't have you don't have the you know the cars or the drivers? Right. What's your income stream? Yeah, it's um, it is a, a share uh, of the um, cost of each trip. So it's typically and it varies some by market. It varies a little bit by product offering, but it's roughly an eighty twenty uh, split with eighty percent going to the driver uh, and then. Uh, in, in exchange for our investment in technology, making the platform available to them to um, uh, match uh, the drivers with willing customers uh, and all that goes with that, um, we uh, have a 20% or so uh, commission. So these are, um, these are independent contractors using our technology platform and um, it's, uh, that, that's roughly what the transaction looks like. I'd like to throw in a <coughs> chairman's question right now for Mr. King. Would you talk, answer the same question for the typical taxi cab service, please? Uh, sure. Uh, our, our taxi cab drivers are also independent contractors. That's pretty much the norm all over the country. Uh, I think the only major market that I'm aware of that, that has employee taxi cab drivers is probably Las Vegas. Market. So our drivers uh, either own their own car uh, and pay us fees that cover the cost of dispatching, marketing, and so on to operate under our operating authority, uh, or they lease a vehicle from us uh, that's set up as a taxi cab, uh, and you know they pay us a weekly fee that covers the use of the vehicle, insurance, maintenance, and again dispatching, marketing, and so on. So it's it's a but they're flat they're flat fees they're not commission based or percentage based. Uh, I have a question for both the Uber and the Red Top representatives. When um, if you could look at the regulations now on taxi cabs and I don't know what they are, I, I'm sure you would the Uber person would think that some of those sh would shouldn't apply to you, and you might think they should. Could you give me a list of things that uh, are currently taxi cabs that are currently regulated? what you think shouldn't apply to you, and could you give, Mr. King, could you give us your opinion on whether they should or shouldn't apply to the Uber? This will be a non-exhaustive list, but a, a couple <laughs> a couple that come to mind are um, uh, vehicle caps, caps on the number of vehicles permitted to operate in a market. And the reason, um, from my company's perspective, those are um, either outdated or just not applicable is that Often those contemplate, I mean, those are calculated based on the assumption that each vehicle is operating, um, if not 24 hours a day, for a, a very significant part of the day. And the drivers that um, partner with Uber, on, especially on the Uber X product, may only drive, I mean, it's entirely up to them. Uh, so they may drive four hours a day, they may drive four hours a week. Uh, they may, uh, do what, what something that's very common is for um, soccer moms to uh, drop their kids off at practice take a couple of, uh, of, of trips uh, and then go back and pick, uh, pick their, their child up. So, um, you know, that vehicle is not operating, uh, it's not creating the uh, load on local roads, it's not um, polluting, it's not doing all kinds of things that uh, a typical vehicle that would be in service constantly um, would, would do. And so to have a fixed cap on the number of vehicles uh, doesn't bear necessarily any uh, correlation to um, what those vehicles are, are doing. So that's one, that's one example. Another might be a minimum fare or a, or a maximum fare uh, rule. We'd say that um, that doesn't um, 
allow the market to respond to demand uh, quite the way uh, it should. And so off the top of my head, those are, those are three uh, fairly typical rules. And let me give you one more, actually. Um, in so, and this is less common, and it's, I believe this is not in force in uh, Arlington, maybe elsewhere in Virginia. But in, um, in a couple places I'm aware of, including uh, Miami and Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a rule of, um, that applies to limousines that uh, decrees a minimum uh, wait time before a pickup. So if um, for some reason, let's say we, were, we had a, a, a plane to catch after uh, tonight's meeting, um, if we were to even uh, step outside, call a limousine company and request a uh, ride to the airport, even if the driver was 10 minutes away, that driver would have to sit in the parking lot for, at least in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 50 minutes uh, because there's a minimum one hour pickup time um, before you could uh, open the door and get in the taxi. And if you did, the driver could be not only fined, but actually arrested for uh, responding to that call earlier than the w mi minimum one hour time. There's some crazy regulations out there, and you know, I think it'd be unfair to place the blame for those on the taxis or on the limousine companies. Uh, who knows where some of these ideas started? But over the decades, they've um, they've accreted, and um, they may have been perfectly sound ideas 20, 30, even five years ago. But they may not, in every case, fully reflect the realities of the current marketplace. And so, um, I think your question is a good one. And um, I, I've rambled for a bit, so I, I should uh, let Charlie take a turn. Because rambling is what I usually do. So thank you, Colin. <laughs> uh, I can certainly appreciate uh, Colin's point of view as far as caps on vehicles. Um, I, I, th I think that that philosophy ref reflects a difference in the business models uh, in that in their, in, in their business model, there's, there, there's frankly no business incentive for them to be concerned with the earnings levels uh, of their drivers. They, you know, they obviously advertise significant earning levels for their drivers, but in fact, their business is to put dots on a smartphone app so they can attract customers. Uh, whereas a community-based taxi cab service has got to, be, you know, has got to be concerned about the viability of, uh, of taxi cab driving as a source of self-employment for its drivers. There's a benefit to the company and to the community and the riders of the taxi cabs in retaining uh, experienced drivers. Uh, it makes a difference in their performance, which translates also into con both convenience and in the, into the area of safety. Now, all that said, we have no expectation that anyone's considering putting vehicle caps uh, in Virginia uh, uh, on these on the TNCs. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a. Uh, I don't think anyone's trying to make a case for that. Um, at, at this point. I, th I think the things that do need to be considered and, and should be sim regulated similarly to taxi cabs or other vehicles for hire are things like insurance. Um, I made some somewhat tongue-in-cheek references to their insurance program. Uh, we, we could probably both go on about that for some time. Uh, but it has gaping holes in it to put the public at risk and you know, there's no other way for me to describe it than that without going into infinite detail. Uh, and that needs, that needs to be addressed. Uh, the, these vehicles have been, and these drivers have been turned into for higher conveyance. They've been allowed to think of themselves in that way, and they're going to act that way, which means that they're going to be out there working for Uber or Lyft or both at times. They're going to be out there working for themselves at times, uh, and, and that creates a sort of insurance gaps that we talked about before. Uh, from a driver vetting standpoint, uh, taxi cab drivers are, are fingerprinted. Their criminal records are checked through the uh, through the FBI database, and uh, uh, as well as through the sex offender databases and and, and so on. Uh, we believe the same thing should be true of the TNC drivers, uh, and uh, whether that will will happen or not, I don't know. Um, but I do know. Uh, and I've discussed it with, with a number of public authorities that the idea of doing a driver's background check online with no physical verification at a bare minimum uh, does not provide an adequate level of protection to the public. I think that's an area that needs to be addressed. Uh, I think in, in terms of uh, vehicle safety, uh, our vehicles are, are not only subject to uh, age and mileage and vehicle type requirements. They also uh, go through additional inspections through the local police department. Uh, 
Um, I certainly don't expect or nor would I advocate that Uber have the, the specific sorts of vehicle requirements imposed on their drivers that we do on ours. I, I, I think it would be an unrealistic, unrealistic expectation, and I try and deal in the, in the, uh, in the plausible uh, whenever I can. But I think that there needs to be assurances taken that the, that the vehicles have been vetted to a significant extent. Those vehicles can be readily identified for what they are as, uh, as TNC drivers bearing some, f some form of trade dress if not a for higher tag, some form of decal indicating that someone other than, with all due respect, the TNC has verified their insurance. I think those are critical public safety factors. And without that, you know, I, I, I think the game should be over. You know, I don't think that it will be. I just think that it should be. In terms of price regulation, we don't anticipate significant, if any, price regulation of these services. However, their dynamic pricing models have produced some egregious results. Uh, under a number of a number of circumstances, and I, and I don't think that the, with all due respect, cavalier arguments about uh, supply and demand and let the market you know let let the market set the price, uh, is uh, is adequate consumer protection. I think that's an area that needs to be looked at. I'm Peter Fallon. One of the hats I've had the opportunity to wear over the years in the community is having served the Transportation Commission, which has some regulatory review. Um, work that they do with the, the taxi cab industry. And one of the things that I was always impressed by, so the county partners with some of the cab companies uh, for the Star Paratransit and I guess for Metro Access, um, is that something that Uber would ever be part of and should it be, given that it doesn't seem as closely regulated? We've got certain niche markets, but there are people who could be left behind with no other choices but the regulated cab industry. Yeah, great question. Um, in, uh, that's something that's gradually being rolled out in more and more cities uh, across the country. In, and, and there's some creative solutions to the reality that um, there is <laughs> that there are not a lot of wheelchair accessible, particularly vehicles, uh, in this country. They're comparatively quite rare. And they're comparatively quite expensive. Um, they I gather start at about fifty thousand dollars, and uh, they can be difficult uh, to to acquire. And so. What, what has happened uh, is that we've, part, we at Uber, have partnered with uh, existing um, provider networks of wheelchair accessible uh, transportation um, to fill, to fill uh, a, a gap or to uh, respond to demand. So in New York City, for example, there's a product called Uber Wave, W-A-V, or wheelchair accessible vehicle. Uh, and the way that works is, <coughs> excuse me. Um, there are uh, wheelchair accessible borough taxis, which uh, if you've been to New York recently, you've seen the green taxis uh, operating uh, in addition to the yellow taxi um, uh, that, that you are no doubt familiar with. Uh, green taxis or borough taxis uh, are designed to uh, extend service to outer boroughs in New York. And uh, they're also, one of their other features is that, is that they're wheelchair accessible. So the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, through uh, an e-hail uh, pilot program, they're calling it, um, partnered with transportation uh, network companies such as Uber, such as, uh, uh, I'm not certain whether Lyft does this, but I think they had the opportunity to bid on it. Um, to, they have the opportunity to dispatch uh, green taxis through uh, the Uber platform. And so that's one example of a successful partnership. In Chicago, too, there's, uh, th there's Uber Wave, but there's also a, a program called Uber Assist. And this is kind of in between the standard um, non-wheelchair accessible um, product offerings and a fully wheelchair accessible um, product. And what, it, what, what that is is a, a partnership with a um, disabled uh, rights organization in the Chicago metro area. Uh, that trains um, selected and high-rated Uber partner drivers in how to um, respond to people with uh, a variety of disabilities. And so they have to demonstrate that they can uh, properly fold and stow a wheelchair in the vehicle and assist someone to enter the vehicle, uh, even if that vehicle doesn't have a wheelchair ramp. Um, but of course, the wheelchair accessible or uh, the population requiring a wheelchair accessible vehicle has that option. And this is all designed in app. And there are other accessibility features that. Uh, we um, that that we offer, including the existing um, iOS accessibility features on iPhone. So spoken um, uh, spoken text. Uh, there are uh, some really interesting ways that uh, some of our um, 
uh, deaf driver partners have uh, figured out how to communicate with uh, with riders. So to sum up, this is evolving in the DC market. Currently, there's not a wheelchair accessible vehicle um, product offering in-app, but uh, it's something that um, that, that Uber uh, operations people all across the country are taking a close look at. One quick question. What does TNC stand for? It, yeah, sorry, it's a bit of industry jargon. It's, uh, it stands for Transportation Network Company, and it's a legal, um, a ter maybe a legislative and public policy term that has been um, devised. I'm not actually sure where it came from. I'm sure Ed knows, but we commonly see it in these contexts. So um, when, we, when I approach a municipality to seek regulation uh, and offer suggestions on what the regulation could look like, often the conversation starts with a proposed TNC or Transportation Network Company regulation or regulatory framework. The terminology is actually from California. Uh, and this is the first mention I've seen of something that's been related to not necessarily just Uber, but the, the general class uh, of services provided. And th this is the distinction that immediately emerged from whatever was coming from California is that they saw and recognized the, the, the fact that these were different types of services. And that's the need for, kind of speaks to the need for this different kind of label uh, that you see being used now. And now your follow-up. Yeah, one follow-up uh, to the professor and the Uber representative. What is the, the market? First of all, I'm a two-year um, very happy Uber um, subscriber, and I, I'd say 80% I work in the district, and I use it uh, uh, primarily for work. It is far cheaper than the uh, taxi system. My, but my, my question is, what is the market? Is it more... Uh, the millennials, and when the uh, professor gave some of the trends there, I was really um, surprised that the, the younger generation, the millennials that don't, you know, have uh, uh, vehicles or whatever, what's your market? Well, first of all, thank you for your, uh, your loyalty. If you've been um, if you've been using Uber for two years, that, that puts you pretty close to the beginning of our operation in, in the DC market. So, I certainly appreciate that. Um, this will sound like a cliche, uh, so forgive me in advance, but uh, Uber really is for everyone. Um, I mean, you're, you're right to talk about millennials because I think it's common for um, that generation to embrace, um, to embrace technology. I mean, that, that's not unique to uh, the time we live in. That's probably always been the case that, um, that younger people are most comfortable with, um, with new products and new services. So yes, they've been quick to embrace it, but um, I, I, it's certainly not just a product for people in their um, in their twenties. Um, uh, you know, we we see um, we see uh, parents using it, uh, particularly the Uber family uh, product that I mentioned, um, and so necessarily they'd be a, of uh, a certain age to even be in the market for such a thing. Um, a lot of business executives use it in the course of their day to um, accompany clients to meetings to. Um, to get across town um, quickly without having to, uh, for example, have a, a dedicated um, limousine company agreement with the corporation they work for, for example. Uh, and so um, it cuts across, um, cuts across age um, uh, distinctions um, uh, pretty readily. There's, um, yeah, does, does that answer your question? I would just say that um, I think the notion that this is a, a generational or a age group um, market is is really kind of not going to serve us well. I think going forward, you'll see the sort of early adopters may have been the millennials, the younger generation, but I think your experience speaks to the general, you know, fact that this is going to be across generations. Um, it's interesting. It just occurred to me that there was a notion um, in the last, say, five years that eventually, because of the stringent uh, TSA regulations for uh, security that there may be a fleet of uh, private planes that would be providing very similar service for executives to fly in and out of more regional airports. And it's, it's ironic that we're having this discussion about surface when, you know, given 9-11 and the aftermath, that was going to be supposedly the next innovation with regard to how we more readily make our way across the country. Um, so it's kind of ironic that we're having this discussion, and that market was going to supposedly explode. Um, but 
obviously, you know, the success of Uber has, has in Lyft and others has kind of drawn us into this discussion, I think. Uh, I'm Joan McDermott, and I have a question for Colin and then a comment for Charlie. So, Colin, do you offer discounts for senior citizens when they uh, call or when they email you for uh, a ride? And what kind of discount do you offer? Um, we don't currently offer senior discounts. Will you think you will be doing so? I I don't know. The, um, the a decision on something like that would be made by um, people in our business operations team, and I, I just couldn't speak to that. Oh. Sorry. I said I had a comment for Charlie. I want to thank him. Red Top Cab has a 10% discount for seniors, and then when you're 70, you get to ride for half price. So it's a, it's a real bonus. And I will very shortly be 71 years old, so I have my coupon books, Mr. King. And I want to thank you for being very generous and cooperative with the, um, for cooperating with us and making it possible for us to use cabs if we need them on a regular basis. I have a friend that, that is almost wheelchair bound and she is found. Is that directed to me? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the, short, the short answer is yes, we don't, but we don't have anything in the, that's in discussion at the present time. And we've offered a direct senior citizens discount through the, through the company for a number of years. We also participate in several programs through the county. And, to, and in full disclosure, I mean, the, pro, the program that Joe was kind enough to compliment us on is actually one of the programs that we do in cooperation with the county. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to uh, claim undue credit. Uh, but we, we consider that a very key part of our ridership and, uh, and do everything that we can to facilitate their use of our service. What are the respective roles of the traditional taxi cab company and the newcomers? Uh, I'd, I'd like that I were, we're able to answer that question in regard to demand, uh, regarding uh, origins, destinations. And that's the black hole in, in that market analysis in that there is stipulation in the California regulations that there be some data, there would be some uh, public access to the data with regard to origins and destinations for the TNC firms. But I, have, I haven't had the opportunity to look and see if that kind of information is available. So um, there's basically two unknowns here. Uh, taxis are relatively small share with regard to if you look at commuting as a mode. And the other issue is we don't really have a, a I don't have a, a strong sense in the, the brief reviews I've done in that there are a lot of analyses of just how large the market is, how many different kinds of trips are being made. Uh, we, we hear anecdotally quite a bit about the popularity, and it's, it's obvious that th these are very popular services. But to look at how much of an impact they have is very difficult to kind of speak to at this point. But I'm hopeful that part of this discussion will help that process going forward, because I think that's very important with regard to the future. I think we all agree here that th there's going to be some regulation. The extent is going to depend on how much we actually learn about the market. The sooner, I think, the better that we'll have that understanding, I think, for all, all parties in, involved. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm a patient academic, so I can, I can wait a long time. I don't think, I don't, I don't think uh, my friend, I have tenure, so I, I, don't, I don't have to worry so much. But if I didn't have tenure, I'd be up here asking for data right now. But uh, in, in the near term, I, I think uh, you know, there, there's always an issue with regard to uh, transparency. And, and that's true of most industries. And, and I think this is one, one question I think that would be very well served with more, more information. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to thank all our panelists and uh, you know, a small token of our appreciation and a memento of the, of the evening. I'll present them each with a committee of 100. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-oh.